Welcome to this little podcast with pictures, which I've entitled Gifts from the West Country, Midsummer 2021. Because last week, Nettles and I were lucky enough to be able to stay with our friends Dave and Barbara, who live at Cleve Farm in the Tamar Valley. And we were there for a week over midsummer. And we were given some wonderful gifts while we were there. And the gifts from two very special people are what I'd like to share with you today. Now, this picture here shows the beautiful River Tamar, which effectively separates Cornwall from Devon and from the rest of England. And this shot was taken at Cateel, near Cateel House, which is a big National Trust property just on the banks of the River Tamar. And it's a wonderful spot and you've got a, a great sweeping view of the river just a little way downstream from Calstock. And this is looking across from the Cornish side uh, towards Devon. And of course, not, not very far from here is, is Plymouth on the Devon side of the river. As you probably know, over the last year, Nettles and I have been collecting items for our Living Norfolk Magic project. And these are all things which are relevant to the magic and witchcraft which is happening in Norfolk right now. And we'd always planned this to be a sister collection, if you like, to the Ikeny collection, which perhaps has a wider remit, collecting items of magic and mythology from all over the world, which have some kind of relevance to Norfolk and the practice of magic in Norfolk. But most of what we have for Living Norfolk Magic has been donated by members of the pagan community locally. But there are lots of practitioners from further afield with whom we have very strong connections. And this is particularly true of certain witches and magicians in the West Country because of the power of those East-West connections which span the widest section of the land from sunrise to the point of sunset. And perhaps also these connections draw some of their power from the lanes known as the Michael and Mary line, which go all the way from Hopton on Sea in Norfolk to St Michael's Mount, just across the causeway from Marazion in Cornwall. Now, these slaves were first doused by Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst, and the whole of their story is documented in the book, The Sun and the Serpent, which has, of course, become something of a classic. Now, there are two people in the West Country who have particularly strong connections with Norfolk. One of them is Gemma Gary, and the other is Marion Green. Now, we've known Gemma for many years, since she was a teenager, in fact, and she was one of the first people to join Minor Arcana, which I believe began in 1997 uh, and was started by Matthew Hannam, who at that time was living in King's Lynn where he was born and we knew then that Gemma was fantastically talented because she wrote articles for the magazine of Minor Arcana, Pagan Teenage Voice and she wrote some beautiful descriptions of magical experiences that she'd had and she also did lovely pen and ink illustrations for some of her articles and for some other articles as well so you know a real talent even at that time and now of course she's probably one of the best known uh, traditional witches in the world and her books 
are so popular with many, many people now. Um, I think most people know her um, traditional witchcraft, a, a book of Cornish ways, and her second book, which was The Black Toad. And she's written other things as well, like The Charmer's Psalter, and also Silent as the Trees, which is about Devon magic. Now, Gemma has been to Norfolk quite a few times and she has done presentations here at various events that we've organised. Um, most recently, of course, the uh, Harvest Moon Conference at the Puppet Theatre in 2015. And she took part in the in the special closing ritual which celebrated a Norfolk harvest. Um, so very, very strong connections. And of course, my own book, um, of Chalk and Flint, A Way of Norfolk Magic, uh, was published by Troy Books, which is uh, owned by Gemma herself and her partner, Jane Cox. So again, that's another very strong East-West connection. And another magical practitioner from the West Country, with whom we have uh, a very strong connection and who has had a great influence on Norfolk magic is Marion Green. Now, like Gemma, she's been to Norfolk many times and has lectured here and run lots of courses on a variety of topics such as remembering your past lives, ritual magic, the golden dawn, um, traditional village witchcraft techniques and lots of other topics as well. So many, many people uh, in Norfolk magic have been taught at some point by Marion. Now Marion has run the Quest Conference in Bristol for many years and uh, the conference and the Quest magazine have both been going for over 50 years now and quite a few of the Norfolk practitioners, including myself, have written articles for the magazine and indeed spoken at the conference. So we dropped in to see Marion on the way to Cornwall and she had no idea that we were going to ask her if she had anything to donate. But as you will see in just a moment, she found some very special items for us. Now, the first item that we have here uh, was the first one that we found from the box of goodies that Gemma had prepared especially for us. And as you can see, this is a little poppet. She's actually a peg poppet and she's dressed in linen. The skirt is linen and it's all edged with lace and you can see it has that embroidery down the front and um, and she's got that wonderful shawl around her shoulders. You can get a little bit of a better idea of her face there, which has been carved by Gemma. Gemma, as well as being brilliant at, at drawing, Gemma does wonderful carvings. Um, but the face here is, is quite simply carved, but uh, she has a very powerful and interesting expression on her face. And her lovely gingery brown hair is actually made of fox fur, which is quite amazing. And Gemma told us that um, this little peg poppet is of the kind that she often makes for her clients who come to her for magical assistance. So we were delighted to receive this one for the collection. We have some more pictures of her here. This, of course, is the poppet back in Norfolk. And so she is sitting there on a hagstone from West Runton. I suppose because she has fox hair or fox fur as her hair, she must be particularly cunning and clever and resourceful. And that, I think, is probably the kind of magic that, um, that Gemma means her to bring uh, 
perhaps to us or to other clients that uh, that she sees and, and does this this kind of um, work for. Here again, you can see her doing some magic here for us in Nettle's living room. This was picture was taken just yesterday. So we've got her little cauldron there, a big cauldron behind her and a lovely big obsidian scrying ball. And uh, as you can see, she looks as if she's working some very good magic already. The second charm that came out of the bag was this wonderful set of three items strung on a red ribbon. And at the very front of the picture here, you can see a black bag which is tied to the ribbon uh, and is full of herbs. Now, Gemma didn't tell us what the herbs were, and there's no way we can see them through the thick black material. But of course, we're never going to open the bag just to find out what the herbs are, because that might upset the magic. And beside the bag of protective herbs, you can see that there's a bone and also a hagstone. The first day you can see is a magnificent hagstone, uh, quite rounded and with a fairly large holes. But um, it sits beautifully on the ribbon there. I'm not sure where it comes from. Gemma didn't say exactly where she'd found it, but, uh, but it is lovely and it has got a very, very nice feel to it. And this is a sheep bone which Gemma found on Bodmin Moor and it's wonderfully brown. It's almost as if it's been submerged in peat or, or something like that for a while to give it that really rich colour. And, uh, and that is strung on the same ribbon and very special and, uh, and of course brings the magic of, of Bodmin Moor to here into Norfolk. The next item in the box was this rather lovely witch bottle, which is a small green glass bottle, very elegant, beautifully shaped bottle. And it's three quarters filled with herbs of various kinds, uh, quite a mixture, I think. And in with the herbs, which is quite difficult to see through the glass, uh, is a paper disc with a sigil for protection on it. And the stopper is not a cork, in fact, although in the picture it might look like it, but it's a beautifully smoothed hazel twig, which just fits the top of that bottle perfectly and uh, gives it a very wise and also rather fiery aspect. So that was lovely as well. And there was yet something else in the box, too. And that was this lovely horseshoe, which Gemma herself had painted. And I have to say, I, I couldn't make the photographs do justice to the wonderful rich colours that she's used on here. There's a base coat of, of, of black here. And then um, it's almost like canal art, the style that she's used to paint the flowers. And what I particularly love about these flowers is the way that um, their centres, particularly the centres of the one at the base of the horseshoe, they're very reminiscent of those uh, Greek and Turkish glass charms which are used to avert the evil eye because yeah, if you look at them they are quite like a stylized eye so that was that was a very lovely thing to receive as well and another excellent protective item which i'm sure along with the bottle will help to protect our collection and here's another shot of the horseshoe propped up against some of our local chalk and flint again from west runton so here we see the combination of cornish and norfolk magic And this is the letter 
that uh, that Gemma had put in the box mm -hmm. to explain the things that she'd given to us. And as you can see, she's written there a few protective charms of the kind offered to clients. A painted used horseshoe from a local farmer, a spirit doll with fox hair, a bottle with protective herbs and talisman, and a sheep bone from Bodmin Moor, herb bag and hagstone charm. And fascinating too, she's written at the bottom more to follow with an exclamation mark. So there could be more little podcasts like this to uh, introduce some new magical items. When we first asked Marion if she would like to donate something to the collection, we thought she might give like a, a, a chalice that she doesn't use or um, some old spells that she'd done or, or a wand that she, she, she never used. But that wasn't what she wanted to give us. Um, and this indeed is very, very special because this mask was made many years ago um, by Marion's late partner, Dick Swatnam, who you can see in that little photograph there. Um, they were together for many years and uh, Dick died over 20 years ago now. And he was quite um, an important uh, magician, but not so famous and well known as as many of the others, because he didn't actually write books, as far as I know, though he did write quite a lot of articles for Quest, and he took part in in many many rituals. He was originally a Wiccan practitioner, and he was a member of Gerald Gardner's uh, first uh, Brickettswood coven. So very much part of the history of the witchcraft revival and, and an important character magically who really does need to be better remembered, I think, than, than he is, because he did play a very important part in the in the magic of the of the 20th century. And Marion told us that that this mask was made by Dick during an event at Hawkswood and it was a group of people who were known as the Company of Hawkswood and uh, some of the leading lights of that company were John and Caitlin Matthews as well as Marion herself and of course Dick and they, they were doing a ritual event there and they made masks as part of their preparation for the ritual work that they were going to do and this was the mask that Dick made and so we were absolutely bowled over that that Marianne trusted us with such a precious item uh, from her beloved partner uh, who is no longer with us and it was lovely for me too to see this picture of him because I, I did meet him years ago and uh, he was a wonderful person and uh, as I say you know contributed a lot to the world of magic and while we were talking about masks Marion jokingly said that well of course you know you can make masks and they're not that difficult to make um, but sometimes just a commercially bought mask, just a cheap one, can be very powerful in the right magical context. And and this was was a mask of uh, Medusa, and that was that was bought just from um, an ordinary shop, and uh, it became imbued with magic because it has been used in a ritual, presumably some kind of ritual of, of Greek magic, but it's very special indeed. And, and as you can see there, it does have quite a scary aspect to it. So it was lovely to have that one in the collection. We did actually have um, a little project to collect masks and Living Norfolk Magic has 
several masks that have been used for ritual and uh, this one yeah as i say although it's commercial it is an excellent addition to our collection now the other thing which is quite an amazing magical object that Marion wanted us to have because she didn't feel able to do a great deal with it was this magnificent uh, papier-mâché statue of the Egyptian goddess Bast who is here of course in her cat form and she is standing on a box which opens out and is full of other magical items connected to Egyptian magic. Now this was made for Marion by a lady called Mari Jones who gave it to Marion um, for her birthday one year and it must have taken her absolutely hours and hours to make so you know we will really treasure this in our collection and I'll just show you a close-up of some of the other bits that are here uh, that's the face which as you can see is it's really detailed and the eyes are just amazing and, and, and full of magic and I love the, the earrings that she's put into the papier-mâché ears and and the little whiskers there are, are, are very very special indeed and really bring this object to life and there you can see the front of the box um, again this this is uh, this is all decorated with things made by Mari herself um, the the goddess depicted on the front there is I think Ma'at you might think it was Isis but actually I, I think it's Ma'at because she doesn't have a throne on her head which Isis would have but she's actually got a feather there and, and that that is the feather um, which which weighs the heart um, when delivering justice and on either side there you've, you've got uh, you've got two eyes of Horus facing in different directions which again are um, you know like many depictions of eyes really important in protective magic and um, you know, really a, an iconic symbol of Egyptian magic and indeed of, of protection magic generally now I said that inside the drawer there were lots of things connected to uh, Egyptian magical practice and these four items are little canopic jars and the canopic jars were used uh, when a body was mummified and inside the canopic jars were the organs that had been taken out of the body and I'd just like to read you what Barbara Watterson says about the canopic jars and the symbolism connected with these figures uh, and this is what she says in her book Gods of Ancient Egypt. From Ramesside times the stoppers of canopic jars were fashioned in the form of the head of the particular son of Horus whose task it was to guard that jar's contents. The jar containing the liver was set under the protection of Isis and Imset. Its stopper therefore was carved in the shape of a man's head. That containing the lungs was protected by Nephthys and Harpy its stopper was shaped like the head of a baboon. That containing the stomach was guarded by Nit and Dalmutath. Its stopper was jackal headed. And that containing the intestines was protected by Selkis and Kebesinoth and topped with a hawk headed stopper. So, that's uh, that's what those little objects are all about and they're beautifully made in FIMO and uh, decorated with Egyptian and magical symbols all around their base as well and the sides of the box 
uh, have got hieroglyphs all over them. And uh, one set of hieroglyphs apparently spells out Marion, which is uh, which is lovely indeed. Though not being able to read hieroglyphs myself, I wasn't able to to pick out which set of, of hieroglyphs that was. But what an amazing uh, object to make for somebody for their birthday, you know, and and such imagination to do that, and and the skill involved too in in creating all the details of these little items that uh, that go with the box and with the magnificent cat which Marion actually refers to as Magnificat. So we've come home having had lots of wonderful experiences in Cornwall but also with some superb additions to the Living Norfolk Magic collection and there'll be a lot more about all of this in future I'm sure. So I'd just like to finish by expressing my thanks and gratitude to Gemma Gary and Marion Green for their generosity in giving us so many lovely things for our collection. So until the next time, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>